Hello and welcome to the Scan On Podcast, your weekly look at the world of film news, Irish and International. I'm your host, Aaron Mooney. Joining me are... Grace. And Alex. So we're going to talk about what we normally talk about, which includes the top 10, the new releases, and the week in film news. But let's start with what we normally do. So what have you watched since last we talked, Grace? I only watched one thing, so this will be nice and short and sweet. I watched The Bling Ring the other day, um, which is one of the few Sophia movies that I had not actually seen before. Um, and I really like this, as is perhaps to be expected. Um, it's, I assume most people know the story, but just in case, it's about, I think it was largely based it's on an article in Vanity Fair, which um, looked at a group of teenagers from wealthy LA neighborhoods who basically went around and robbed a bunch of celeb houses. Um, in quite a fascinating way, they just looked up the addresses on the internet and then went up to the houses and found unlocked doors because that's a thing that people do apparently even when you're super rich and have tons of money um and then nick you know clothes jewelry the works that sort of thing and eventually they got um found out and a couple of them went to prison for it so um yeah but this is a really really fun film because it's such a skewering look at how vapid celeb culture is right down to the way it's presented because you have this group of characters there's maybe four or five of them who are kind of leads per se um and you never really find out anything about them. Like, they literally have no depth, no personality, nothing. They're all just archetypes. Almost as if they're there to represent the weird, obsessive, narcissistic, superficial culture that they're all so caught up in. But I also enjoyed the many throwbacks to 2008 culture in this, such as lots of looks at the hills and terrible fashion and Paris Hilton and that sort of thing. It's a really fun, I think, um, microcosm of what celeb culture was like at a particular point in time and how this group of kids, while it may have been criminal behavior, it was in many ways quite a cunning way of going about ripping people off. So it's very enjoyable. I really like it. Cool. And that's it. <laughs> that's <laughs> literally, literally, it. literally it. Alex, what have you watched since last we talked? Um, well, I just came back. I was very lucky. I spent some time in Cuba recently, so I wanted to watch a film kind of about Cuba. So I watched, uh, it's called Yo, Yo Soy Cuba or I Am Cuba. It's this... Um, it's a really remarkable film, and it's got a really remarkable story about it. Apparently, it was made in the 1950s by um, Mikhail Kalatov, uh, who was a Soviet filmmaker. And cool. he sort of was told to make like a battleship Potemkin for the Cuban Revolution and found that instead, when he got to Cuba, it's such a sort of like dazzling, mad, frustrating place that he kind of thought, no, that would never work. This is sort of a, a different country, a different culture. So he made this um, really incredible like film and it, the story there's five stories and they all kind of represent different sort of like pre-revolution post-revolution personalities and characters but the way it's shot is incredible like it was one of these things that i saw a scene from it and thought like that's the modern film though that's like some you know modern t and when you find out it's the 1950s it's incredible oh yeah well i mean that soviet cinema in general is surprisingly good at that in yeah. terms of like watching it and it's like the editing and stuff. Yeah. The, the editing, but also like the shots and the panning and the, the camera's like literally acrobatic. There's a scene where it's floating through a party and, and it goes underwater briefly and then back up again in the swimming pool and then out around. It's wow. incredible. That's and apparently awesome. none of the Cuban people liked it when it came out because oh, it wasn't okay. sufficiently kind of... It's Patriotic? Sort of, exactly. It was kind of like showed um, some of the sort of uh, Batista sympathetic people a bit more favorably than people would have liked. And similarly in Russia, people just didn't get it because it wasn't, again, sort of, you know, strong Gun and about the revolution yeah. enough yeah. and any of this. Stuff. So it, it just sort of like languished for 30 years until in the mid-90s, I think, someone invited Martin Scorsese to like a screening at their house and he like freaked out about it <laughs> and uh, they just gradually started like showing big directors to get their names attached to a restoration yeah. so they'd show Coppola and he'd be like yes <laughs> have money yeah. and it's it's doing the rounds now they've got a, a really good um, they call it 4k but you know, you know <laughs> it's a 1950s black yes. and white film so it's incredible <laughs> looking um, and I would really highly recommend it again story wise not much there to talk about but the, the, the cinematography the sort of majesty of it, the way it, the camera actually moves the way it I've never seen a film sort of like feel as precise, although it exists mostly in montage, if you know what I mean. Like it feels mm -hmm. so surgical in its montage and in the way the camera flows around. It doesn't feel woozy or doesn't feel like sort of like a little bit lost, which is a bit like Rocket Man, which I also saw, but we'll get to that because I imagine that's in the top <laughs> 10. Um, so that was incredible. And it's, it's a film I would really, really strongly recommend. If any cinema is showing this, see it on a big giant screen and, and definitely check it cool. out. Cool. Had you seen it before, Grace? No. 
it definitely would recommend. Um, then the other film I went to, it, it's part of a series that I'm loath to mention another podcast on this, but there's another really good fo- uh, podcast called All Units, which sort of like looks at thrillers and, and uh-huh. things like that. And the guy who hosts it has been over the last six months kind of hosting one film a month up in A4 Sounds. And most of the time, like the films, I've maybe heard of them, but have never seen them because they are there. And he has to write his own subtitle tracks and everything sometimes because really? wow. they're usually Those quite pretty... obscure. Yeah. But they've all been um, really, really interesting. Some of them like really, really incredible. Some I didn't love as much, but it's always one I always check out. So it's called A4 Sounds, the No Chorus podcast to check that out. But the one I saw last week was um, Confessions Among Actresses, which is like a 1970s film made by a guy called, and I'm going to pronounce I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, Yoshige Yoshida, who was the director. He made this series of like sort of very stylistic Japanese films. And this one is, is sort of one of these. It's about um, several women all, who are all actresses and are all giving interviews of some sort. But it sort of blurs the line between are they acting or is this a play or is this their real life? And certain things are implied in interviews and scenes they're doing. And then we get flashbacks, but then... Those further flashbacks are sort of undermined. But again, the story doesn't matter because this film is incredibly beautiful. The the shots in it are, again, you know, it's from the 1970s, but genuinely like nothing I'd sort of ever seen before. You, you start when it's one of these films you see and then you start realizing that directors that I had previously credited with an incredible eye. I'm like, oh, no, they're just ripping it, yeah. off this guy. <laughs> so um, I would also really check that one out. Really, really fantastic cast as well of um, 1970s Japanese actresses. Oh. Those were my two films. All right, cool. Uh, very briefly, because I had a very light week, um, I watched the Three Colors trilogy. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a, a light week. week. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, they're, they're That's actually quite heavy. <laughs> I was actually surprised, like, rewatching them, how brief they are, because I think they all clock in. Uh, white is like 90 minutes. I think the other two are 100 minutes each and stuff like that. And it's amazing. I feel like their reputation probably makes them seem more monumental than they actually are in, t- in terms of running time. I yeah. mean, well, I mean, it was because these are the rare, like, I've, I've been quite candid. I am not like as well versed in world cinema as I should be um, but it's okay Jay and Ronan aren't here to make I know that. to shame me to publicly <laughs> shame me but um, like Three Colours was that big a deal in the 90s that I'd seen it as a kid like I'd rented it from the local Extra Vision and Aww. seen it because it was like hey you have to see these things and they're big and important and they're kind of cool and you know they, they speak to cinema and all this sort of stuff and it's great going back and looking at the advertising material like because the Weinstein company uh, marketed these as well like the poster or like cover VHS cover for Three Colors Blue is a picture of Juliet Binoche and a pull quote that consists of mysterious dot 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 sexy exclamation mark. <laughs> Um, the exclamation mark really makes that quote it really like, sells mysterious, it. but it's like sexy. Tommy Wiseau's room, where like he cut half the trailer and said like uh, a drama with the passion of Tennessee Williams, and then he found out everyone was laughing at it, so he added in. A quirky comedy, like immediately after the drama <laughs> with the <laughs> Tennessee Williams. Uh, which is great, because I mean, you know, you could argue Blue is mysterious. I'm not entirely sure you could argue it's sexy outside the fact that it's just French. Um, and also, like, Three Colors White is sold with uh, Julie Delpy on the cover, completely ignoring the fact that she's at best a secondary lead in it as well. But actually, like, I was surprised at how well, first of all, they hold up, because I mean, there's been a sort of a, not a pushback against them, but a sense that they're sort of like pretend, they're, you know, that sort of like postcard art house sort of sensibility, like yeah. the other stuff the wine scenes or Miramax would have brought, but like they do uh, have Cinema that Paradiso. sort of 90s art house air off them where it just it does feel a little flat or something. But I don't know. The, <laughs> Maybe that's just me. The, that's kind of what I love about them because I feel like having watched them, I never need to watch another European art house film again. <laughs> they are just so so concentrated there's a moment in red where you know the, the valentine picks up the phone to her boyfriend michelle and he's like are you alone all alone oui. and she responds <laughs> yes all alone oh my god and it's it's kind of amazing how the film just has no sense of oh there's a moment where um you know obviously uh, julia Binoche's character julie in blue gets a phone call from the boy who like pulled something from the crash where her son and her husband died uh-huh. And he's like, I have something to give you. It's important. And she responds, nothing is important. Uh, it's it's so ridiculously over the top, but kind of brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And like the rare film that's able to pull this off. I think they were famously and cynically designed. And again, I kind of love this. They were cynically designed. They were shot and produced in 10 months. 
and they were designed to premiere at each of the three big European film festivals and take each of the big three prizes at the European <laughs> film festivals. Like a clean sweep. It's kind of amazing yeah. how, how calculated that was. A lot of planning was. went into that. Oh yeah, fairness. so like, obviously I think it was uh, Blue premiered at Venice, uh, where it shared the Golden Lion with, I think, Shortcuts, Robert Altman's Shortcuts. Uh, it was White premiered at Venice, uh, sorry, at, at Berlin, where it took the Silver Bear for Best Director. And Three Colors Red premiered at Cannes, where it lost out on the Palme d'Or to Pulp Fiction. Um, to give you a bit of 90s nostalgia there. That's a very 90 sentence. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do, I actually think they hold up remarkably well. And they tap in their very 90s movies in a way even beyond what Grace suggested. They've got this whole sense of like affluence and sort of like people who live in giant like apartments despite being students or who have villas in the country but can move to Paris and like move into these gigantic yeah. palatial lofts. There's a moment where Julie discovers a, a you know, a mouse in her loft and she's like, uh, she goes to the real estate agent and she's like, do you happen to have another loft? About the same size, <laughs> costing just as much. And he's like, I'm, I'm sorry, it won't be available for another three weeks. And she's like, damn it. Um, which is, again, the level of affluence in which we exist. Yeah. But it kind of... Within... I do blame like films like this for giving me this very youthful, <laughs> stereotypical image of France where everything was just impossibly polished mm. and perfect and very like arty and maybe even slightly quirky, but quirky in a very rich way. <laughs> and then like you go to France and you're like, wait a minute... <laughs> Yeah. what's going on here I, I like the idea that it's like art house like Nancy Myers is basically how yes. we're pitching it um, <laughs> which is rich people with existential problems yeah. and, 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 and enormous it, houses in yeah. which to hide their existential problems but I like that because I mean that aspect means it can focus in and again that's the 90s aspect you know the sense of the 90s of well we've got nothing to actually worry about the Soviet Union's fallen Europe's being united we're all prosperous so I mean what are we going to do except like stare into middle distance and Wonder if we really are all alone. <laughs> um, and it, like, they're absolutely beautiful you could pieces. You play of that work. heart song in the background there, too. <laughs> How do I get alone? <laughs> but uh, again, they look stunning. The, the sound design is stunning. The music is amazing. The performances are fantastic. So, again, absolutely love them. White, I'm a bit less fond of. I think White has had a bit of a reappraisal recently where you have people like Slate arguing that White is the underrated classic of the series. I'm still in the traditional White is the weakest. Because, I mean, there was an Ebert's argument that, you know, blue is a tragedy that isn't tragic and red is a romance that isn't romantic. White is a comedy that isn't funny, according to Ebert. Mm. And that's that's like that's not something you can turn into an art house yeah. virtue for me. Um, but yeah, no. So I, I enjoyed those and, and sort of really liked them. And I also watched Chernobyl, uh, which is great, but also not a movie. But I would wholeheartedly recommend oh, yeah, people watch that yeah. as well. Um, all right, then. So let's move on to the week in film news. Uh, in terms of Irish film news, uh, Vim Diff are taking five Irish films to the 22nd Shanghai International Film Festival, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. A nice selection of sort of like Irish films from the past year will be premiering there. So they'll be including um, Rosie. Oh, sorry. So the, the five films that are going will be The Hole in the Ground, mm -hmm. Rosie, Float Like a Butterfly, Greta, and Poppy Chulo. Not too shabby. Quite That's a diverse a good broad amount. range. Yeah. yeah. It's a nice sort of sampling, I think, of what Irish film is in 2017 and 2018. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Or 2018, 2019, even. I feel like a lot of them should travel well as, as well. They should indeed. I'm actually kind of, it's great to see uh, Poppy Chulo traveling as well, particularly given that, you know, you hear a lot of stuff about the, you know, homophobia and Chinese cinema and stuff like that. Mm. It's kind of great to see something that is so openly. Mm -hmm. um, sort of kind of gay and celebratory sort of premiering there as well. Yeah, so a wonderful array of films as well. Uh, in terms of uh, other news, the IFI has launched a major fundraising campaign ahead of its refurbishment project. Um, so you can actually uh, donate, become a member of the IFI and have a seat named in your honor in the I've new cinema this, that they're yeah. refurbishing you as well. You have someone literally sit on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which again... It, like it's great it's very nice um, and it, it's a wonderful cause and very worthy of support it is a bit of a shame that this is necessary if we're being yeah. entirely honest I was going yeah. to say if Niall were here I feel like he would be mentioning that this should not be something that they have to do yeah. when they need money because I mean yeah. the IFI is a huge cultural service it's been around since 1992 it tons of archives um, like pretty much every week on the podcast when we have Ronan on Ronan has been on an expedition to the IFI yeah. and sort of and come back with treasure it's always a learning journey yeah, it is yeah. um, mm. But and it's, it's a terrible shame that there isn't a way to kind of restore it properly and get them a bigger space and one that kind of befits the public service that it that fulfills. Because I remember the first time I was in the IFI and I came in and I was like, this is just like a series of narrow corridors. Like, it feels like it should have more scale, you know, and it's just a pity that you can't 
get the money publicly funded in there to do something with it and make it a bit more. I'll be the the jazzy. one guy who puts his hand up and is like, I kind of like Screen Two in the IFI. The one I have no strong opinions on okay. the screens. Other than that, if your seats are so narrow yep. that even I, a like pixie of five foot two height, that is uncomfortable in there, then you've got a problem because the vast majority of people are much taller than me. So. But uh, yeah, so if where you... do they put their legs? No, yeah, especially the one in the. I did an IFI course recently, which was great fun. Uh, the only problem was the other people doing the course. Like it's like the Q and A part of the thing. Just oh, every okay. week. Every so week. that sometimes drove me nuts. I have a question. But, uh, actually, more of a statement. More of a statement that yeah. I'd like to now read out. Why did you change the ending of this? <laughs> Why did you but, make it terrible? Yeah, the course itself was good. It was just in that tiny cinema at the very top of the IFI. So every week I would be like, yeah, oh my goodness, knees yeah, beside that's not my very ears. Comfortable. Yeah. Um, if you want to donate, um, you can text IFI to 50300, uh, so 5300, which will donate €4. Euro. Um, or you can shop via, uh, or you can visit shop.ifi.ie slash name your seat as well if you want. Uh, and it's a very worthy cause and uh, very worth supporting. Uh, in terms of uh, international news, there's probably not that much going on. It is worth noting that uh, we're now entering award season in television, and I kind of love that the Emmys have announced suspending of voting rights and an ongoing investigation into attempted vote rigging. Um, My stars! Yeah, I know. Um, the scandals just keep going. It's the college admission scandals, but with Emmys. Um, <laughs> it's not going to be anywhere near as trashy and fun, though, and much less likely to have a terrible but horrendously enjoyable real-life movie made out of it. I was going to say, I want the Sofia Coppola bling ring version of that college admission yeah. scandal. That could be great. Yeah. William H. Macy plays himself, the sad suck loser who gets sucked into crime. Mm, yeah. An eight-part miniseries, please. <laughs> have, you, have you seen that photo of him with the birthday balloon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> um, That's Fargo season three for you. It really, yeah. it really is. It's very Coen Brothers movie. It's kind of nice to know that you take that with you when you leave the set. Yeah. Um, and also, again, the, the Emmys have also um, engaged in um, again, more rule changes as a result of Megan Amram, who's a writer on The Good Place. Um, she launched a digital first series called An Emmy for Megan. Is this the same one on Twitter? Yes. Yes. Oh. So she launched it. Obviously. I which, mean, Megan Amram's going to be in the world. Yeah, which was uh, delicious. It was basically, it's, it's her parody of kind of an Emmy campaign, uh, which ironically managed to get her nominated last year, but also <laughs> resulted in a slew of Emmy rule changes yeah. to prevent it from ever happening again. People um, just suck the joy out of everything. <laughs> most famously, um, a, a rule change insisting that the maximum length has to be over a minute. Uh, because apparently that was not in the spirit of the awards as it was intended. Boo. Uh, all right then, so let's move on to taking a look at the top ten. I wonder how different it is from last week. It's not that different. Um, at number ten, it's Avengers Endgame. Still hanging in there. Still there. Wow. Yep. It's... I would not mind getting to see this again. Well, it looks if like I get it the chance. might close actually just shy of um, the all-time total of Avatar. For shame. Within like a hundred million. Wow. At least someone might remember the name of a character in Endgame. <laughs> Unlike Avatar, who where I do remember names, but only because one of them has the same name as me. So. <laughs> um but yeah, um at number nine, John Wick Chapter Three, Parabellum. Whoop. Yep. Love. Whoop. Can't wait for John Wick Four. I wonder what the subtitle for that one's gonna be as well. Another obscure Latin phrase. Yeah, yeah. No, I think he's fantastic. Sick and Magna. Like Inter Arma. I've been such a fan of this series ever since the first one because it's so simple and clean and he's so watchable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Inherently watchable. He is and indeed. And they're just beautifully made. Like, they're just a joy to watch in every way. Yeah. Like, Keanu's great. The story is just basic, yeah. easily yeah. enjoyable, stuff, and everything yeah. looks fantastic. Cinematography's fantastic. And then, like, the supporting the cast are so good. It's like, yeah. oh, they're in it. Oh, yeah. they're yeah. in it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I reiterate what I said last week that I want them to put Hiroyuki Sanada in one of these movies and then I'll just explode with glee <laughs> and that will be everything I'm, I need in life. I love Ariane Moss for the next yeah. one. Like, yeah. Oh. Yeah, just sort of get that Matrix <laughs> union oh, kind of fully going. Just slowly build it yeah. again. Yeah. I'll be um, hyperventilating. I do love that, I do love that like John Wick Chapter 3 has like a funny accent off with Angelica Houston where it's like you can do a Russian accent right? And mm. she's like sure. Of course they can. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a Jerome who's like you can do an Italian right? There's, there's no reason why you're character can't be British, right? Yeah. At number eight, it's Ma. I haven't seen Ma. I have not seen Ma, but I, I was intrigued by Luke's description of it last week, by yeah. which I mean it's a shame. It's kind of shitty. Have you have you heard the, uh, speaking of, of Luke, have you heard the Luke Evans uh, situation with regards to Ma? No. 
Okay, apparently there is a scene in the movie where in Mr. Evans <laughs> is in a vulnerable situation, a prone situation, as it were. Um, and there has been some discussion amongst people who have seen the film as to whether or not he went uh, full au natural for that scene. Oh, and whether right. or not what you can see is actually... in that scene is, is Mr. Evans, as it were, as nature intended. Um, Evans himself has been very coy on the subject, uh, okay. literally apparently sending out a tweet consisting of, so I know you all are talking about <laughs> that scene in Ma, dot, dot, dot. And that's the tweet. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. Another reason to see it, I suppose. Yes. Probably not going to get me to pay money for it, but, you know, I might <laughs> fast forward to a certain part of Netflix whenever it rocks up. At number seven, Pokemon Detective Pikachu, which is doing remarkably well and continuing to do very well. If this hangs around for a while longer, I might even get a chance to see it. It's... I saw it the other week yeah. and was pleasantly surprised. I went with a guy who was super into Pokemon and couldn't find anyone to go with him. And as I'm Aww. between jobs at the moment, You're I was like, deep. yeah, sure. <laughs> so away we went. And it was really, yeah, it was surprisingly well made and surprisingly kind of heartening. And the cast it's... were great. Aww. Justice Smith yeah. is really good. It's about as good as this movie could be. Yeah, which is absolutely. Like, yeah. Which, and he's so fluffy and cute. He is indeed. The decision to go... And one of the things I really like about it is the decision not to go photorealistic because we've all seen the Sonic trailer, right? Oh God! Yeah. yeah. So the, I like I like the idea to have them feel like cartoons. It all because again, the obvious point of comparison is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah. But they look unreal. They look elastic. Yeah. They look like Mr. Mime looks like he's made of balloons. Yeah. Which is kind of creepy if you think about it, but looks really works really well. But they just the pack so many things like into every screen. I found even when I'm like the storyline isn't much to no. know, talk about, but. Even in those scenes, your kind of eyes are wandering off and you're looking at something else. You're like, wow, they really got Pikachu's cheeks really well. Or the, the city, his eyes. His eyes are the, the scenes in the city. They're like Pokemon everywhere. So yeah. you're just watching them. And then there are all these like weird little in jokes all the way through it. Like there's a Seinfeld reference and the posters in Bill Nye's office are the arrival circles and yeah. things like that. Like they're just crammed as much in and it's just literally something for everyone. And I kind of adore that in the spirit of like, you know, in the spirit of Who Framed Roger Rabbit being PG-13 Chinatown, I like the Pokemon Detective Pikachu is PG-13 Get Out, <laughs> which I kind of love. Yeah, yeah. They should have just put that in the poster. Um, at number six, take that, The Greatest Hits Live, the concert Amazing. film. Amazing. Wow. I think this may be the highest sort of entry of one of these we've had in quite a while, at least since Andre, Lu Andre Rue. Um, and it's doing quite well to do that well at, in the middle of the summer. I was going to say when there's like loads of actual concerts. Yeah. I think Backstreet Boys played the other night and like mm -hmm. all these other yeah. bands are playing and, and take that or pack in cinemas. That's cool. Well, Which then is... it's, it's probably quite fortuitously timed, really, because everyone's just riding in a wave of nostalgia. And they're mm -hmm. like, hey, if I can't go to see you in person, I can see you projected onto a very large screen in That's high true. definition. Yeah. At number five, it's Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Okay, I will admit that after listening back to last week, I almost want to see this, but probably not enough to actually pay to see it. It's not good. Because it sounds terrible. Yeah, it is. I have a lot of time for Godzilla films, and I saw this one yeah. again the other day, and... You saw this one again. No, I sorry. I mean, like, I went to the first one, the oh. first in this series, disappointed. Liked the King Kong one and was sort of like, yeah, oh, yeah I'll go to another one of these. And then I'm right back to like, okay. oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they don't know how to make a fun Godzilla. And like a couple of years ago, Shin Godzilla came out, yes. which was so much more fun and kind of knew what it was doing and knew it had these ridiculous over the top things. Well. And it was clever and like had this whole like subtle thing about Japanese bureaucracy and like making fun of governments not being able to like handle crises and stuff. It was great. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, they, they have a really good cast. Like, you're watching Thera Farmiga do the, these really, like, earnest line readings, but it's just nonsense, and it doesn't make sense. And it's like halfway through, they realize, like, oh, we actually need to have him fight some monsters. Yeah. And then it just turns into the last third of Superman, or Man of Steel, yeah, where it's yeah. just a big CGI mess right. in the rain. Yeah. yeah. There's, yeah, and there's the recurring thing with Kyle Chandler, where Kyle Chandler's character starts out like he wants to punch Godzilla. And then at the end, then he falls in love. With then Godzilla? he falls in love with Godzilla. It's a rom com between Kyle Chandler and Godzilla, but nowhere near as fun as that description makes it sound. I did love the scene um, with the the. I won't give anything away, but no spoilers or anything. There's a scene essentially where one character says um, goodbye, old friend, to Godzilla yes. and pats him on the nose. That was that was that <laughs> ridiculous. Was like, but we awesome. actually singled out that scene last week as, as like well. A... Luke was Luke was like, yeah, we want more more of if that. You, if you yeah. could do that, <laughs> I mean, because even even the camera work there is like this is something that's worthy of. All all, as yeah. opposed to this is what a migraine feels like. Yeah. Um, anyway, at number four, it's Rocket Man. I saw this only the other night, and it was kind of funny because I went into this sort of expecting 
it to be a lot better than Bohemian Rhapsody. And in many ways it is, because it wouldn't be hard to be that much better than Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> We're starting from a little far. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one thing that I think Bohemian Rhapsody deserves credit for is the like the sequence, especially at the end, where it sort of like realizes, aid, where it? it just plays four or five songs by Queen in a row. And it's like everything else we screwed up, but we can do a passable imitation of a Queen concert, which is something to like behold. And is, as you say, something worthy of awe. Yeah. And uh, Well, I mean, even even like you look at the charts, you've got Take That Greatest Hits Live. It's a small step to go from that to why not just do Freddie Mercury's concert at Live Aid, but with Remy Malik. <laughs> with like, Remy I mean, Malik, yeah. <laughs> I think he make the same amount of money. Yeah. But, um, and I was kind of going into this sort of thinking, and it, it, in, on the one sense, it tells a much more, in some ways, accurate story about someone who was sort of very avant-garde and, and doesn't shy away from some of the aspects of his life that Bohemian Rhapsody was accused yes. of shying away from, which was all all good. Well, and and the main guy, despite not looking anything really Tom like Elton John, yeah. is good. And uh, there's a hilarious scene at the start where he's like, what's a poor boy from Essex or whatever? A poor fat boy from Essex with big glasses going to do? And I was thinking, like, he doesn't look anything like a poor <laughs> fat boy from Essex. He's like a little yeah, muscular. Um, but then, you know, the whole the whole film, I just felt it never really took off to, to borrow it. I just, I, I didn't love it in the same way. It wasn't it, as, yeah. Did it stick the landing, though? <sighs> I think part of it was it sort of got delirious with montages, you know? Yes. I'd started every now and again, I'd start thinking like, oh, this is kicking off. It's kind of has characters sing certain songs, but then it sort of gets a little bit too CGI and a little bit too cartoon and, and uh, relies a little yeah. bit too much on tricks and things. Just when you're starting to get into a song, something ludicrous will happen and you're kind of a little yeah, thrown pushed back. by it, pushed mm-hmm. back. Yeah. Uh, my big issue was the dialogue in the non-musical sections. Because obviously musicals are, you know, they're, their drama, but as you know, as like yeah. rock anthem, their stadium rock narratives, yeah. basically. But the the issue is that like when you have Rocket Man and you start applying that sort of like Nolan esque theme as dialogue sort of stuff, yeah. where you have stuff like uh, the the father storming out and saying, "You tied me down with that kid for eleven years, and I finally have an excuse to leave." Yeah. as he People finally has. People don't pay a... <laughs> to see Reginald Dwight; they pay to see Elton John. Yeah. Yes, um, or even <laughs> or the creepy little later, boy showing I'm sorry, up. Bernie. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or the bit where, yeah, his 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 Bernie Tauben is like, uh, you know, the or the image of Bernie Tauben is like, you write music that makes millions of people very happy. Yeah. You just need to learn to accept who you are and love yourself. And it's like, thank you, movie. You still have to do the work to get me there. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't. And I also like there were so many scenes like that where they just sort of wrote down bullet points and yeah. had characters read them out. It was... Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to, you know, forgive some of that if the like music scenes and the musical scenes are are out of this mm-hmm. world. But they just I like the musical I scenes. Think, I have to say, I yeah, was... I think I said this last week, but I think my big issue with this was that I wish it had a director that had a bit more visual panache yeah. going for him. Because I think, like, I think it's it's well made for what it is, but I really would have liked to see something a bit more spectacular for the musical scene, something that could really capture the joy and heraldry and everything of it because if you had that to sort of liven up everything else then you wouldn't really mind all the other scenes that are bookmarked onto it just to say now this has happened Mm. we've gone here and here's another song and it would be like you know some brilliant lavish spectacular feast but they're not really like they're they're grand i don't think they're bad or anything but i wish that they just had a bit more electricity to them julie tamor's elton john would be yeah better mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but hey we're so, going yeah. we're going to see cinemas flooded with these in the next couple of years that's madonna of i want a madonna one well fletcher wanted a madonna one as well i believe okay, so you're well, going to be getting a dexter maybe fletcher i don't madonna. want a dexter fletcher madonna <laughs> now that you're too late you made with, the wish with the monkey's with paw respect <laughs> we gave you the monkey's paw grace you had one wish it kind of reminds no, me though of... i want like a punk madonna movie <laughs> like get i don't know what's uh, your one's name who made wayne's world get her to make it penelope penelope, penelope yeah. spears I think so. Something like that. Anywho, something um, like that. Anyway, I just want something. Mad. I think that's the problem, though. The people like they're they're so successful. It's kind of like Disney going by. I think I've said this before on this podcast. Oh, don't worry. We're going to have an occasion to talk about that and just. But a few it is like yeah, it's like Disney going back and sort of like taking you know their old films and then like sort of doing a pleasant cgi version which doesn't really change that whole much but people are kind of like that's what people are doing going back to these like out of this world pop stars and Mm -hmm. musicians and then being like and how can we get this to maybe pg-13 and how can we like get get these into the cinema to be fair to rocket man rocket man did end up with an or which is one oh yeah no that and that's what Um, i was saying it is it is kind of at least it does show that it does it feels a little bit like and again this was the issue more with the freddie mercury with bohemian rhapsody um but there's an element of this with rocket man where it feels like 
you can just package the songs. Like, because I mean, I I left the cinema for Bohemian Rhapsody humming Queen songs for the next two weeks, which is great because you know everyone loves Queen, and you know I, I obviously love Queen beforehand. But it's like, hey, it's a nice refresher of how good these songs are. Same thing with Elton John, where I've been hanging around on you know I've been on Spotify, I've been listening to your song, I've been listening to Saturday Night's All Right and stuff like that. Tiny Dancer. And it's a nice sort of packaging of those. Again, as, as you point out, the obvious comparison is the Disney stuff, where you're repackaging. Mm. Like, you're repackaging the old films and the intellectual property as well. You know, like, one of the things about the Dum- Dumbo, which just recently left the top ten, <laughs> because, of course, it only just recently left the top ten, is that, like, I suspect a large part of that is repurposing Dumbo in a family-friendly, non-racist fashion, mm. so they can hold on to the intellectual property and just keep all the branding and material and sort of mm. advertising revenue and stuff like that associated with the brand. Yeah. And, like, one of the other things I think, especially with the um, with Bohemian Rhapsody and Rocket Man, is they kind of they're they're, they're made they they're, they almost feel like they're made by a group, you know. Like yeah. let's make this, let's do that, let's take this out, let's you know, yeah. let's have that character portrayed in this way. But it's going to be like one of the more ridiculous things is with Rocket Man. I didn't really ever know where it was going. Is like what's the the big thing he's going to get over here? His drug addiction yeah is he going to meet david furnish i didn't know where it was going and then uh and then at the end the the i'm still standing you know when he yeah. sort of sings that song which again you want to talk about cynicism the movie premiered at can the video for i'm still this standing is what i was going to say yeah. I, I remember reading before the film that he was hammered when he was making that video so like <laughs> again was sort of like looking at the timeline and then you know the hilarious you know villain who's played by the game of thrones actor literally in both bohemian rhapsody and this yeah, i want the shared universe where they just <laughs> rotate through apparently there was going to be a scene Do you see here dexter fletcher said that he had an idea where elton john was going to be at dinner with his mom having a fight and then he was going to look over and see freddie mercury in his room yeah, looking played by rami oh, malik meeting with um the john reed from the rocket man film oh, who's played amazing. by rob stark can, not littlefinger yeah can we can we have like bob geldof show up and say yeah. i'd like to talk to you about the live aid initiative eventually it'll yeah, be like sure that's like that youtube comment i saw where it's like the post credit scene and rocket man will be freddie mercury going darling i'm putting together a team yeah <laughs> yeah that could so, be good that's where we are now i kind of want both um I, well actually elton john didn't take part in do they know it's christmas did he but they did live it he did live yeah, okay. it so it, live it is the end game yeah. that's that's, that's what where we're getting there yeah. yeah and then it's uh, just the whole concert it's, it's actually, actually, it's actually yeah. the whole concert oh, <laughs> we just wow. get all biopics and then <laughs> just, bam yeah it's like oh the live phil collins eight. one in the air tonight yeah oh my god mm. we're so, <laughs> you can hear alex shudder over yeah. the microphone <laughs> the phil um, collins biopic. wait until someone gets it into their head to try and make some sort of definitive beatles biopic because well it's funny because like casting for that will be a wall of fun i was like going along walking into rocket Man and there was a poster for a new film of using Yesterday. the songs of Bruce Springsteen oh. and then I saw a trailer to Yesterday so there's like mm-hmm. two other films coming out where they're trying to do this packaging of songs just not in a way that we tell a yeah. story about yeah. the actual yeah. person yeah. singing them yeah. which could work you know it's worth a try but yeah God knows the, I kind the... of prefer the Mamma Mia jukebox musical approach though at least like have a stab at creating something a bit different because mm. Yes, well, there are many fans of Mamma Mia, especially the second one on this podcast. And it is fun. And that, that way you get to sit there and like listen to loads of ABBA songs and bop and, and have a good time. But you're also getting a story that you're at least sort of invested in, mm. really. Because the, yeah, I suppose the problem with biopics as well is that you sort of know where it ends. Especially <laughs> with with figures like Elton John. He's still alive. Um, Freddie Mercury Dublin, is not. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like at some stage. Which seems almost like a tie-in. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely. He's like doing this farewell tour that's apparently taking three years to go- farewell. I was going to yeah. say, like, surely this is like the fourth or fifth Elton John farewell tour, right? Yeah. yeah. One more tune. Um, One more tour. At number three, it's X-Men Dark Phoenix. He- the lowest grossing... eviscerated last week. The... I have only heard bad things, including <laughs> last week, so I'm not going to see this. Yep. The lowest not. grossing X-Men movie, apparently rewritten on the set as they were filming both... You I know, don't understand how, like, you make Apocalypse and then think, all right, guys, let's get the band together again. Let's, that was let's atrocious. Up. Like, I thought this was got to be out of this world. <laughs> Clearly, they had an idea to, like, yeah. put Apocalypse to bed and absolutely not. They just... What to be, to... I mean, maybe they started out there and they were like, okay, we're, we're going to do this and we're going to do it right. And then everything just went to hell. What yeah. to be, like, to from be that initial fair meeting. to Dark Phoenix, which is a phrase I've used far <laughs> too often. But no, to, to, get, to give Dark Phoenix credit, at least one of the things that it does right or one of the things it understands conceptually is that it exists very much as a response to the worst excesses of apocalypse in that first of all it's under two hours which is always a good thing mm-hmm. um second of all mercies. second of all though it's actually consciously small in scale it's like it's 
And again, this is one of the things where it's going to sound like I'm being really sarcastic and biting and mean, and I don't want it to, so I'm just prefacing this with this. But the big action sequence at the climax of X-Men Dark Phoenix involves the X-Men trying to cross a street. That's the stakes and scales at which we're operating. They're trying to get from one side of the road on Central Park West to the other and have to get in a big, gigantic knockdown brawl just getting across this little thoroughfare of road. God. And I kind of admire the fact that it, it's kind of it's back on this sort of small scale stuff. Now, the film has been cut to ribbons. It doesn't make any sense. It's got no real thematic or consistent through line. It's got a whole jumble of big ideas. In particular, it's set in 1992. Which is an interesting just choice. Just before Fastbender aged into McKellen, presumably. Yeah, 1999. Uh, yeah. those, those seven years were really tough on him. <laughs> really, really tough on him. Sadly, we're not going to probably get another film exploring that those years. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sort of, of it'll just be a gradual CGI face just, morph, yeah, like the slowly. end of Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. Um, or Terminator 2. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, Which it, is on in the IFI on Saturday. Uh, Dark Sky season, yeah, isn't it? I was going to say, give that nice. a shout out. Yeah. And 70 millimeter, apparently. All right. So that's probably a better shout than Dark Phoenix. At number two, it's The Secret Life of Pets. Two. You know, I've seen the first one of these and I kind of liked it, but that doesn't mean I'm going to rush out to see this Is one. Is it a pet favorite of yours? Oof. No. I heard they swapped out I'm Louis C.K. for, um, what's his name? The other guy who's sort of... It's probably a Patton culture. Oswalt. Oh, I thought Patton Oswalt was in the first one as well. I thought that they swapped them around. Oh, that was okay. the only well, thing I knew. Well, the, any, it's, it's probably an upgrade. I don't remember Patton Oswalt in the first one, oh, okay, but it's so entirely that's... possible he's there and just went right over my head. Um, at number one... And I think this brings us a nice dovetail back to what you're talking about there. Aladdin is still number one. Oh, um, I'm, I'm, no imagination. I'm loath to see this because Aladdin was like the first really? film I ever saw in the cinema, the first Aladdin, wow. and it was like a big deal. And um, um, you should probably not see that. That's what I'm kind of nervous about, <laughs> about yeah. because yeah, it's I fine. loved Aladdin. That was my favorite yeah. film as a kid, and now yeah, I'm a little like I'm, I've heard like it's fine, and yeah. people have said it's good and everything. But, yeah. It's- not awful it like again it's it's that thing that you're talking about where it's made by committee or almost by algorithm you're building off a template of something that worked perfectly in animation and converting it to something that approximates live action which is a weird choice because like it worked in animation because of the strengths of animation so trying to translate it without actually adapting it yeah you know is counterproductive and self you know self-destructive self-destructive and stuff it does have like a couple of key advantages to it like that help reasonably well it uses its time better than the, um, what was the recent one? Oh, The Beauty and the Beast. It used the additional 40 minutes that it's obligated to have, because every movie has to be two hours long now, um, that's been grafted onto the animated film to develop the characters of Jasmine and Jafar, which is as reasonable a choice as you can make in those sure. circumstances. Uh, it gives Jasmine an I Want song, uh, which is a good choice as well, even if the song itself isn't particularly great. Um, and it also, Will Smith as Genie works rather well, because the the casting and Smith himself understand that like the genie is a star role and there are only like four or five actors in Hollywood that are conceivably stars in inverted commas anymore. Yeah. We seem to have moved past the idea of movie stars and towards intellectual property. Yeah. So Will Smith is like, he feels almost like he's found a little bit of flotsam in that ocean in which he's been floating for the past like 20 years. Yeah. And he's because uh, never that, should have turned down the Matrix. Yeah, we will find out. <laughs> I saw that uh, Gemini. I think Man it's trailer. better for us though. Than <laughs> it was going to be Val Kilmer. Was going to be Morpheus. Really? If I remember correctly. Oh my oh. god! <laughs> and and if I'm I remember, I'm the only one excited by that probability. Oh, clearly. <laughs> wait, wait for it, Grace. And if Val you... Kilmer's suggestion when he was like, "Well, we, you might be Morpheus," was, "I like the script. I like the role. I think though, I have some suggestions." And the big one is that Morpheus is the real hero of this narrative. Of course. Um, <laughs> That's the most Val Kilmer thing I ever said. Uh, oh. Don't ever change Val Kilmer. Yeah. Oh. All right. So let's move on to talking about the new releases. And actually, this week, uh, I've been very lax. I haven't actually seen any of the new releases that are out Well, if you week. haven't, and we more than likely Probably haven't, haven't yeah. this ought to be like a rapid fire round. All right, then. So... Balloon is out this week what from Studio is Canal. Balloon. It is a German. I'm glad you asked, Grace. Uh, Balloon is a German thriller that deals with the crossing of the inner German border of the families uh, from. Oh the wait, Deep I North. know what this is. They they do it in a balloon, a hot yeah. air balloon. Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry. Continue. No, you 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 got it. Like you got it in one. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that that's opening this weekend. Um, it's adapted from Kit Hopkins' screenplay, um, and Michael Herbig is directing. Who's in it? Um. David Cross, Caroline Schuck, Alicia von Rittbert, and Frederick Muck. 
David Cross, like Tobias no, Forrest. No, no, it's a K. There's a K. <laughs> okay. Cause that would be like, yeah. <laughs> That's a Wait, really what? great <laughs> casting. It's, we need one for international audiences. <laughs> yeah, throw him in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He doesn't have any speaking lines. He just sort of, uh, he refused to learn German for the role. He just spoke phonetically. Um, also out this week, which I'm actually quite excited about. I've been hearing good things about uh, Diego Maradona. Um, oh, yeah. I'd go see this. From the director of Senna and Amy. I love um, Senna. I hated Amy. Oh, OK. I so... like Amy Winehouse, I should say. <laughs> yeah, just... I just didn't like that documentary. But yeah. I, this you is, think you talked about this. that. You said, was it kind of exploitative? Yeah, I, just, I, I the... remember like, they just, they, it was one of these that had a lot of shots of like her, you know, essentially all the photos that tabloid um, journalists sort of took of her mm-hmm. and then sort of like moralizing um, voice over ah. all these photos being like and the tabloids harassed her here she is with her boyfriend in the park and they couldn't stop taking pictures and I'm like yeah but guys you're, you're using those you're using these and charging money for people yeah, yeah. yeah so I was just a little annoyed by that but I really like Senna so this is seems similar sort of yeah similar stuff I definitely will go check the most out. important moment in Irish sporting history I've been informed I know nothing about sporting history and therefore have no critical analysis of that statement also at this Maradona <laughs> is of the, the the documentary apparently captures it. Okay. All right. So I've been informed. Um <laughs> so it has a tally that's 19 a, in it somewhere. Yeah. According to the notes that I have in front of me. <laughs> um also at this week the Hummingbird project uh, which is Jess Eisenberg, Alexander Sarsgaard, Salma Hayek and Michael Mando oh, yeah. about a pair of high frequency traders go up against their old boss in an effort to make millions in a fiber optic cable deal. This is the film that Famously or infamously uh, was screened on the first Sunday of Vimdiff this year with a screening starting at, I think, nine o'clock at night, which I had a ticket for. Mm. But I had bought a ticket to the surprise film beforehand, mm. which started at six o'clock. I figured, hey, that's a perfectly reasonable amount of time. Nobody There's... would dare make a film longer than that. Yeah. Especially with Mel Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so I did not see The Hummingbird Project at Vimdiff. Uh, Ronan did. He was not a big fan of it. It yeah. doesn't sound particularly not a great title. Arresting, I have to say. Alexander Sarsgaard goes bold in it, though. I don't know if that's a selling point. I have no strong opinions on Alexander Sarsgaard, so I can't tell you there. And we also uh, Jesse Eisenberg. Uh, this oh. week we got helpfully reminded of some of his wonderful interview no. coverage as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man gives great interviews. Mm. Uh, also at this week, We the Animals, um, which is directed by Jeremiah Zager, um, starring Sheila Band, Raul Costello, uh, Evan Rosado, and Josiah Gabriel. Manny Joel and Jonah. Biblical. It does. All those names. And We the Animals as well. Yeah. But it's a story of three people who tear their way through childhood and push up against the volatile love of their parents. As Manny and Joel g- grow into versions of their father, and Ma dreams of escape. Jonah embraces an imagined world all of his own. That sounds mm. awful. It sounds very well, where the wild things are yeah. a little bit. I like where the wild things are. Did anyone see the trailer just on film news to Doctor Sleep? No, I know, the Ewan McGregor one. It's been released. Yeah, I saw it this it came out this afternoon. I didn't watch the trailer. Though. Good God, because like they literally are refilming scenes from The Shining, but like it's not The Shining. It's it's surreal. It's like but... you're you're trying to remember something and it's not something slightly off. The corridors mm-hmm. are like slightly wider or something. Because yeah. Doctor Sleep is the story of the kid, right? If it's apparently it's follows Danny, Danny right? Torrance, yeah. and and much later he's played by Ewan McGregor and he's grown up and now he's Doctor. Oh Sleep. my God, I love that Ewan McGregor's cornered the market and your childhood favorites have grown up depressed. Yeah, yeah. It's like. Christopher Robin, <laughs> Robin and, and The and Shining. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Wow. Good for him. Yeah. It's good that you have a niche. No, so, it looks bad. Like, let's, uh, it doesn't look Okay. Great, yeah. uh, it would be one to sleep on, is what I'm getting oh. here. But um, the only thing going for it is that Mike Flanagan made it, right? So mm. it might Ooh, be. Uh, Mike Flanagan, he's the guy who did Oculus and stuff, isn't he? Um, and obviously, I'm not sure he did Oculus, but, but he, he did, did Hush well, and did Hush. Hush. Hill House. Game yeah. and Hill House. Hill House. Yeah, Hill House. Yeah. So he, he has a good track yeah. record, at least on making things that are unnerving. And a good yeah. cast. So, you know, maybe yeah. it's just the trailer that doesn't look great. So many trailers these days are underwhelming. Of course, so many films are underwhelming. So you think they should have brought in a script doctor? Did that just come to you, like, just there? Just there. Or have you been cooking it for a while? Anyway, and finally, the big release of the week, um, which only filmed for critics here yesterday, which is always a sign of confidence. Uh, I haven't seen this yet. It's Men in Black International. I've heard bad things. Yes. And I'm looking forward to this. Like, I'm going to go because I love the Men in Black. And obviously Tessa Thompson and um, Chris Hemsworth Hemsworth as well. The Thor Ragnarok reteaming as well. Mm. Yeah. 
it's unfortunate. I've seen a couple of very unfavorable tweets, like who you know people saying that it's not just bad, it's terrible. Mm. I think some people are probably being a little harsh. She says no, um, but I'll probably still go and see it. That wasn't directed at you. I was thinking of a different tweet. Um, it was. You made a very guilty face. I there. remember people saying like the third one was bad. I loved. The I loved the third one. one. Yeah, I thought Michael Stuhlbarg discussing baseball. Yeah, so which is, good. Michael Stuhlbarg. That's all. all I, you I know. Either. But just Michael Stuhlbarg. But Jermaine <laughs> Clement is the villain, and yeah. then there's two Jermaine Clements. So good. And yeah. then I, Josh Brolin, like. Absolutely getting Tommy, Tommy Lee, Lee Jones' Jones's voice mean, down and look and manner. It was so good. That yeah. is literally all that he should do. In fact, like, you know, if they wanted to do an old man Thanos story in Avengers Endgame, they should have just brought in Tommy Lee Jones Perfect. again. And it's funny because yeah. I saw the trailer show, I think, Ad Astra, where like Brad Pitt has to go into space to find Tommy Lee Jones' dad. And the whole time I was thinking, this should have been Josh Brolin yeah. going into space <laughs> to find his dad. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so Men in Black International, the reviews are, if we're being charitable, uh, not good. Um, the best reviews that I've seen of it have generally been, well, this is a film that exists. Oh, the no. bad reviews have been, this is two hours of my life, I'm not getting back. Mm. Um, which is a shame, because I, you know, I quite like it. Is, I feel like we might need to start categorizing terrible films at the end of the year, too. Like, this was bad, but was it, I actively regret losing yeah, this hour, yeah. this amount of time in my life bad? Yeah. Well, no, we, we, we have generally avoided Excuse worst me. films of the year in the past couple of years, and I think that's a good choice. Yes. If you're at the end of the year, I think it's, it's good yeah. to celebrate. Only if you're going to do films that everyone, the vast majority of people can agree on. Like, for example, Dark Phoenix or Godzilla, which I'm sure 99% of people would be like, yeah, these were bad. Yeah. Waiting that's... for the release, the Kinberg cut of uh, Dark Phoenix. Oh. <laughs> All right, that about wraps us up. But if people want more grace, a bit more Alex in their lives, where can they find you guys online? Um, I am on Twitter and Letterboxd at Pixie Grace. I run a podcast about Irish films called When Irish Eyes Are Watching. Cool. You can follow me at Darren underscore Mooney. Uh, I also host another podcast called The 250, where this week Grace is actually joining us to discuss Rush. Yo. To mark the passing of Nikki Lauda. Imagine uh, like an F1 car sound here. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> Sorry. I don't think we're going to beat that. That was that was that was not special effects listeners. Uh we'll be back next week. Bye. 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 Bye.